All right. Take yes. it away, Jen. All right. Well, thank you, Olya. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jenny McFarland. I'm the Burke Conservation Biologist for Tucson Audubon. I'm going to be co-presenting this evening with uh, Olya Weekly, also with Tucson Audubon. And we are going to be talking about desert purple martins. And this is a bit of a two-part, sort of a two-section talk. We'll be talking about desert purple martins and what they are, why they're so special, and then segue into a really exciting situation that Tucson Audubon's in where we're working on a nest box design project, which is a brand new sort of thing for us. And it's really very exciting. So we wanted to leave plenty of time at the end for questions since this is just such a brand new uh, thing for Tucson Audubon to be, to be working on. Okay. Oh, go ahead to the next slide, will you? All right, so a little bit about where we're talking about. Desert purple martins do live in the desert and specifically Sonoran Desert. So this is a really nice example of um, Sonoran Desert. It's really quite a, a lovely you know, habitat type. If you live in Tucson or have visited Tucson, you should have seen habitat somewhat like this in the Tucson area. If you have visited or lived in the Phoenix area, you'll have seen Sonoran Desert that looks a little bit different. So there's more than one type of Sonoran Desert and the, the habitat type we're dealing with specifically with desert nesting purple martins is this sort of upland Sonoran habitat, the little bit more lush, wet Sonoran Desert that you get in the Tucson area. Go ahead, Olia. So this is a really cool map. I love these maps. So I use them a lot in my talks. This is an eBird map. You might have to hit that play, yeah. It's a movement map. So this is gonna be an animation showing a year for Purple Martins. Uh, technical difficulties, unfortunately, it's not working. Not working? I okay. No, it's okay. So what, what this map would have shown is as the this bar progressed, through um, the year, Purple Martin surged into the eastern part of the United States sooner than they do into this southwest region. And this will be also shown on the next map. Go ahead to the next slide. Okay. So here in Arizona. So this is an eBird map. So this is from Cornell University. If you go to eBird.org, you can see all sorts of really cool maps like this on demand, really interesting product maps. I highly suggest eBird. If you're not familiar with eBird or if you don't use it very much, you really should go and check it out. It's really very cool. It's totally free to use. And you can see these really, this is a map that I just generated on the eBird website showing the locations based on people's sightings. So you, you feed eBird data and then you get really cool products back. And this is showing where purple martins as a species were seen in you know, the Southwest area of you know, the continental United States during July and August. So as we talk more about purple martins, the desert purple martins, they are very monsoonal tied. So they're very monsoon, summer, rain abundance breeders. So this cluster right here, is um, going to be where our desert purple martins are hanging out, the ones we've been working with. All right, go ahead to the next. Okay, so this is showing, first of all, desert purple martins. So this map here on the right is a really good map that I got from the, um, this, okay, that I got from the National Geographic Guide to Birds. If you're looking for a map that shows the different subspecies ranges, this field guide is one of the best resources out there. So this is from the National Geographic Birds field guide, a scan of their map showing the range map in the United States of purple martins. So purple martins themselves are a pretty well-known famous bird, especially if you've lived in the eastern half of the United States, you've probably seen purple martins or at least maybe seen those big white nest box houses that people put up for them. And that's sort of this, I'd say kind of the main people, the main, certainly the subspecies people are most familiar with is the one that's in the eastern half of the United States. They're pretty widespread throughout the eastern US, this Subis subspecies. But there are two additional 
full subspecies of purple martin. One is the arboricola, which nests in forest habitat. So you can get them in places like Flagstaff. So right above this line here, so this arboricola of the west, they're pretty spotty throughout the, the American West, but they are in patches along the Pacific Northwest, the coastal regions, and you can get them in Flagstaff too. But the one that we're most focused on is this desert purple martin, which is the Hesperia subspecies. And you can see this, this area here, you think, Yulia, if you hit next, I think I have a circle around it. It's very um, limited. So this is a pretty darn small range. It's just, it's really limited to Southeast Arizona and uh, into Baja, California, and then some small regions of Northwest Mexico. Go, go to the next slide. So this is a pretty similar looking map because what this is showing is the range of Sonoran Desert. So these are extremely, for their breeding habitat, they are extremely tied to Sonoran Desert. So this, this darker uh, tan color is showing the outline of Sonoran Desert globally. This is the only place Sonoran Desert occurs in the world is in this sort of western, southwestern portion of Arizona, a little bit into California, parts of Baja, California in Mexico, and, uh, and a little bit of Northwest Sonora. It's extremely limited habitat. And even more limited within Sonoran Desert is the range of saguaros. So these birds do nest in saguaro cacti in holes that have been made by woodpeckers. And this is showing where saguaros occur within Sonoran Desert. And it's, it's quite limited, as you can see. Go to the next slide, Olya. Now, there was a bit of that Sonoran Desert that didn't have saguaros indicated on the range. And there is a similar cactus that occurs in these regions like Baja. So you get these cactus called cardones, and they're really very cool. They look like if a saguaro mat, you know, mixed with an organ pipe. They're a really large columnar cacti, and purple martins will nest in them very in a very similar way that they do to the saguaros here in Arizona. So this is a nice, this is a photo of a very, very large cardone down in Baja. And these are some photos I got from eBird of Martins hanging out on top of cardones that they're nesting on in Baja. So when we say saguaros or desert purple martins nest in saguaros, what we really should say is they are ex so far exclusively known to nest in large columnar cacti because <laughs> the cardones are closely related to saguaros, but they will nest in either in woodpecker holes, you know, woodpecker cavities made in cardones or saguaros. Next, Olya. So we have been working with desert purple martins since 2020. We've been, you know, in a very serious way trying to figure out what's going on with desert purple martins. They're a very understudied subspecies. Very, very little work has happened with these birds, and they're just absolutely fascinating birds. And once we started getting into it, this Oli and I especially, it was pretty much us in 2020 trying to figure it out. And then we got more people involved in 2021. Um, I, as soon as we started, I think it, it became apparent to me why so little work had been done with Desert Purple Martins. It's very challenging working in Sonoran Desert in the middle of summer. But we did it and it has been extremely rewarding and the program has just, uh, the project has just grown. It's been very cool. So this image on the left, this GIF image is of Olya trying to see inside of a purple martin nest, nesting cavity in a saguaro. So it's really funny seeing some of the logistics that people who study desert purple martins in the Eastern half of the United States deal with. When they wanna look inside a nest, they will often target a, like a, a nest box condo, condominium with multiple pairs nesting in it. They're usually up on flagpoles and they'll just literally use a winch to just lower the whole box and then open the door and look inside. We can't do that in these saguaro nesting uh, birds. So we have to use wireless endoscopes to peek inside of these holes. So you can kind of see what's going on here, this giant extending pole that Oli is using. And here's a photo of me this is a photo taken from the endoscope camera of me down on the ground. But we use these uh, extending painter poles. We attach wireless endoscopes to the end that then communicate with our smartphones. And we're able to peer inside of these nests. Go ahead to the next slide. And uh, starting in 2021, once Oli and I worked out 
how to do this, which definitely took some uh, trial and error in 2020, which was great because we could be out in the field by ourselves in 2020 working on this. Um, we then in 2021 held a training workshop and trained some volunteers on how to do this procedure. We got more equipment and we got more people out there looking into saguaro cavities. We did acquire permits from Arizona Game and Fish, the Park Service and Pima County to do this. And they were great because we were trying to explain this totally new thing. And Game and Fish was really great about like, well, if you do a workshop, this is uncharted territory. Sure, I'll put them on the permit, whatever. <laughs> so that was great. So we got more people involved and we will be doing this workshop again for summer of 2023 if you would like to be involved and want to help us get more uh, visual data on these birds. Go ahead, Olya. So this is what we have been working on uh, in these first several years of the project is just trying to figure out some of the basic information about these birds. There's so little known about desert purple martins that even just real basic stuff like, well, when do most of them nest exactly? And, you know, what does it look like inside those nests and which direction do the cavities tend to face is largely a, unknown. So we've been working on a lot of this real sort of stuff that's usually nailed down for a subspecies, which is really exciting too, to be working with a lesser known subspecies and getting really cool data. So this is some preliminary results from uh, the data we gathered in 2020 and 2021. Uh, go ahead and hit next, Olya. It's a little arrow is gonna show up, yeah. So this is the direction breakdown of the nest that we found. So this was of 88 nests and they, the vast majority of them, 72% had some sort of westerly exposure. Now, when we did a little more research, it turns out that this is true also for Gila woodpecker holes. So, but just, it also was true for Desert Purple Martins that we did find nesting activity in all compass directions, which is also very interesting, but the majority of it was westerly. Go ahead to the next, Olya. So I also wanted to just sort of show what we were seeing inside of these cavities because it was been, it was amazing when we first started doing this to see what was going on inside of cavities because these these really awesome endoscopes that we got online, they're they're pretty small. They they have their own little light source, so they're bad, they're rechargeable. You attach them to the end of the pole, and they're shining a light inside the cavity, and it's great because they're not like super, they're not too bright. They're bright enough though that you get a pretty good image of what's going on. And this I think has also helped. I understand why in the past people weren't doing this because the one paper I did find that really talked where they did a big in-depth study on Martins, which happened in the early 1990s, they were using mirrors to see inside. So very challenging field work little tiny mirrors and then people using binoculars to look up at the mirrors. So we have the advantage of using wireless endoscopes now. And these are some of the real images that we got from inside of saguaros. So the top left is a mama with her eggs. Then um, then the, the next one over on to the right is little very young babies. This is a photo uh, top right of a young male, it turns out. It's a young male who is nesting and he's gathering leaves from an okatillo to put and we watched him then take those leaves into a nesting cavity because they do put they do tend to put leaves and twigs as you can see in these photos in the bottom of the cavity for their nests and then the the bottom photos the bottom two left photos are babies inside the nests looking a little bit more like purple martins and then this great photo on the bottom right that uh, Keith Shawcross got one of our volunteers shows fledglings that have left the nest but still demanding food from daddy as he flies over. All right, go ahead, Olya. So we did have another really interesting, cool advantage working with Purple Martins where we have some really nice robust partnerships and one of them is with the Purple Martin Conservation Association. So this is a big conservation nonprofit out of the Eastern United States that works pretty much exclusively with Purple Martins. That's how popular they are in the East. They have their own, there's a whole nonprofit dedicated to Purple Martins. And with, uh, we utilize some of their resources to come up with an aging guide. So these photos of Martins are taken from Eastern subspecies, but it's, it's, it was close enough for our purposes of trying to age these birds. So this is a guide we put together. So when we could get images of babies and nests, try to figure out exactly how old they are. Go ahead, Olya. So we have different 
phases of nesting that we like different categories that we developed that we then classify our data points under so we could get a sense of timing of when these birds are nesting. And the first one is nest building. So sometimes we look in these cavities and we see some leaves inside the cavity, but or some twigs, grass sometimes, but nothing else. All right, go ahead to the next. And then eggs, so this is the next category that we will document. So eggs being present, and they are really pretty easy to see inside the cavity, they're pure white eggs, and they do incubate them 15 to 18 days. So once we see eggs, that's a data point we collect, but we don't know exactly when those eggs were laid. But um, once we see chicks, we can kind of backtrack it to a, a date of when they probably laid their eggs, but they do take about 15 to 18 days to, to hatch. When we see little chicks that are featherless and have this transparent skin, we know that they are one to five days old. When we see this, and we do, I have seen a lot of this. These are all our own photos too, just so you guys know. These are photos we got from inside of Soros. Um, when you see these feather sheaths, and what we mean by that is like, they look almost like little pins coming out of their, their skin. These are, a bundle of feathers that will burst open and become multiple poof feathers inside of this sheath. So, and we did see this sort of thing a lot. You can just, this tells me just that these birds grow so fast where you'd see a little pink one with his giant siblings that are a lot bigger. And then you go back later and they look almost the same age. That's how fast they grow when they're that young. All right, go ahead to the next, Olya. And then chicks aged, uh, 10 to 14 days was our next category. And this is what they, they look like when their feathers have started to sort of poof from their sheaths. And then uh, age 15 to 19 days, they're feathered but scraggly. And this is also, they start to look like martins now that you can really kind of see that they have distinct sort of um, individual feathers coming in. They're, they still have really bright yellow gapes and they also, behave in this way of just sort of staring right at the camera. They do that a lot too, still at this age. All right, go ahead to the next one. <laughs> they get the next category, they're a little older, aged uh, to 20 to, what does it say, 26? Aged 20 to 26. And this is when they're fully feathered and they start to look like actual little birds. This is when they start to look pretty cute and they're a little more active too. When we stick the camera in there on the pole, you can see them sort of reacting a little more to it. Sometimes um, that first year, especially coming closer to the camera or sometimes backing away uh, or just sort of being curious about it. All right. And then fledglings, this is one we've started documenting as well. Sometimes we go to a nest or an area where we've had a lot of nesting and you see young ones just sort of hanging out. And so this feather photo on the left is, is Keith's photo. Keith shot across this photo and it shows, it's such a cute photo of these little young, that have uh, that are out of the nest, but still being cared for quite a lot by mom and dad, bringing them food. This photo on the right is one I took in Sarita this past summer, and you can see this young one sitting on the wire. But if you look at the wood crossbeam uh, on a, this is like a telephone pole, the, the crossbeam, you can see three little heads peeking over. This is uh, more fledglings that are waiting to be fed. And when we were watching this, uh, these fledglings hanging out on this pole and, and the wire, there was some migrating like tree swallows coming through because this was August and these are, this is end of summer. And so some of the birds, like things like swallows are starting to migrate through from the North. Um, these tree swallows were coming through and these fledgling martins, desert purple martins were flying out and sort of they were chasing each other, chasing the tree swallows. Tree swallows were chasing them back. It was very cute. It was very much sort of play behavior. And then everyone just went back to the wires. All right, go ahead to, to the next one. So we've been compiling a lot of data and we're working on this for uh, the 2022 data. So we'll be updating this soon. But the the how we've been working this out so far is we've been collecting a lot of data. So this is the information from 111 nests, many of which were visited multiple times. and you can see there's a lot of clustering happening. So on the on the um, the y-axis here are the stages that we just discussed, those sort of age groups of nests, and then the dates going across the, the x-axis. And you can see there's quite a lot of clustering. So eggs being present, clusters sort of very late June into 
kind of mid to three quarters of the way through July with a big cluster in early July, which matches um, the studies that were done in the 90s as well. And then you have, but these clusters towards the like fledglings being seen or very chicks that are very close to fledging happening mid to late August. But there is quite a lot of variety as well, which is, took me by surprise how much variety there really was where we were finding eggs with nests or excuse me, nests with eggs present as late as early August and even into mid August. So it's definitely a lot more variable than I would have assumed at the outset. All right, go ahead to the next one, Olivia. Another thing we were really interested in trying to figure out is how closely, how densely do desert purple martins nest? So this is something that was discussed a lot in the um, original study that happened in the early 90s by Bridget Stoochberry. She wrote a great paper. It's a really good paper on this, on the desert martins. And she did most of her work pretty exclusively in Saguaro Park West and Tucson Mountain Park, sort of west of Tucson. And she never found two nests in the same saguaro ever in her two-year study. And it had never been documented, multiple nests in the same saguaro. But they are, you just have to sort of watch them to realize that they're pretty colonial, where they'll be in saguaros near each other, but they've never been documented in the same saguaro. So we did document that in 2021 and then again in 2022. So here's their photo showing a saguaro with two active nests happening in the same saguaro. I did observe multiple or two, two sets of parents going to these holes, but you can also see when the birds are pretty close to fledging, the babies actually stick their heads out of the holes and demand to be fed. And this nest on the left and this nest on the right both has babies sticking out demanding to be fed. And I did see multiple parents coming to the different holes. Right, go ahead, Olivia. So yeah, two nests, one saguaro. This is another saguaro. This is a, a different saguaro where we also observed two nests in the same saguaro. Both of these were in Sarita. And which I think is important as to why Bridget didn't find it in the 90s because in Sarita, the saguaros are much less dense and they are big big, big old saguaros out there. So this was a, a, a saguaro that we named Country Club 2. It is on Country Club, south of Sarita Road. And we had, I suspect that there was two nests in 2020, but I didn't verify it. And then I did verify it in 2021. And then again, in 2022, the same saguaro had um, two nests. All right, so I have a zoom in if you go to the next slide. Yeah. So why don't you hit it one more time? So you can see here, this is a zoom in showing where I did manage to get in the same photo, of parents going into both nests. So this is this one on the left is a, a male hanging on the outside, dropping food to a young one. Because the chicks get older, they kind of come near the hole. So the parents just kind of stick their head in. But when they're younger or on eggs, like on the right here, the adults go fully into the into the nesting hole. All right, go ahead, Olya. Now this is showing, oh I'm sorry, can you go back one? This is showing both nests at the same time. So those two nests where the two parents were hanging on the outside, this, uh, the, the hole that was on the left, this photo on the left is the view, once I put the endoscope camera in, that's the view of what we saw inside. And then the photo on the right is the view of that right nest. So it was eggs in one nest and pretty feathered, pretty developed chicks in, this, in a cavity on the left in the same saguaro on the same day. So that was pretty cool to see such a difference in um, sort of nesting timing. All right, go ahead to the next one. Lee. So in 2021, we, or excuse me, 2022, this past summer, just, you know, six months ago, we did a whole new thing for the Purple Martin Project, Desert Purple Martin Project. We, every summer, we've been sort of doing something new, innovating, sort of reaching new milestones. And uh, this last year, Six months ago, we did something totally new. This was new in general for Tucson Audubon, doing this kind of work with birds, and certainly new for the Desert Purple Martin Project, where we caught some birds. So we did this with a lot of partners. So this is um, this photo on the right shows Joe Segrist with uh, Purple Martin Conservation Association. So he has uh, all sorts of federal permits to be handling Purple Martins. And we went out there with mist nets on really tall poles and tried to catch desert purple martins in the Sonoran Desert in the middle of the monsoon. And it was a challenge, as you could possibly imagine. Putting up mist nets in an area that's full of thorns is 
difficult, but we did manage to catch some desert purple martins. So this photo in the top middle shows um, Jonathan Horse and Aya Pickett, who both also work at Tucson Audubon, where we caught a martin. So we've lowered the pole, lowered those nests, um, nets down, and Aya, who's a trained uh, bird bander, is removing the martin, uh, this is an adult male in this case, from the nets. I just want you to hit next one more time. Okay, and then this is what it looks like. So this is a tracker. This is a little electronic device that Joe then, uh, with having done this a lot on Eastern Martins, expertly attached to this adult female, Purple Martin. And this little device will track her migration movements as she does her full circle journey. So this is a path tracks tag. So this is one that takes like almost like a GPS point and stores it in internal memory. And then we have to recapture that bird again the following summer when they return, get that device off of her and then download the data. So there's a lot that has to happen correctly there. The bird has to, first of all, survive its full migration journey. We have to catch her again, get the tag off and then download it. So we did get trackers like this onto eight adult purple martins in 2022 and we're hoping to capture them again in 2023 and get that data from them but we also have a new thing we're going to be doing this just got federal we just got federal authorization to do a different type of tag this coming summer so summer of 2023 we will be putting argos tags on desert purple martins and that's the kind of tag that electronic tag that gives you data in real time so we'll be able to watch the migration and the wintering area of these birds starting next summer with tags that do not have to be retrieved to get the data off, which is very exciting. Nobody knows the migration pathway of desert purple martins and nobody knows exactly where they winter. So this will be very cool, very exciting groundbreaking work for, uh, for Tucson Audubon and just new to science for desert purple martins. Go ahead, Olya. Thanks so much, Jenny. Before we move on to our next part, uh, talking about saguaros and our nest box design challenge, I wanted to pause and uh, let you answer this question from Peggy. We have in the chat, when you saw nests with eggs in late season in August, did you follow and see hatchling and fledglings from this nest? That is such a good question. And yes. So when we saw nests that had eggs very late in the season I did go back and because I was curious what was going to happen I did go back and check and we had young into September so they had young into September and I kept going back and it was so weird to go to an area a nesting saguaro like to a patch of saguaros that I had been um uh, multiple times throughout the summer and had Martin swirling around because you know as soon as they see you coming they start alarm calling and all their buddies swoop in and like sort of alarm call and swoop around and these really late nests I'd go back and it was just mom and dad no one else was there the other Martins had sort of ditched them <laughs> so I did see one of my nests in Sarita that had a very late eggs I did watch and I went back several times and I have no reason to believe they didn't fledge successfully. And uh, one I watched, they did hatch, they did have young, but then I went back when there should have still been young in the nest and nobody was there. So I don't know if that nest failed, but one that was very late, it really seemed to me like they definitely did fledge. I didn't see them fledge, but I saw them late enough, you know, where they were feathered and looking pretty old. And then I went back when they should have been all gone and they were. So yeah, I think they did real well. Yeah, so, so, so yeah. interesting and so strange since around that time they're starting to get ready for migration, but some of them are just so brand new that they still have a long way to go. <laughs> um, then we also have a question here. Can you share the brand and place of purchase for the endoscope? Yes, I will drop that in the chat when you're talking, Olia. So the brand is called Depstech is what we use, D-E-P-S-T-E-C-H, Depstech Wireless Endoscopes. I got them on Amazon. I think you can get them anywhere but they have sort of a couple levels of quality and, and they're they're really good i highly suggest them so yeah i'll get that information um only not put it in the chat yeah and if you wanted to be part of our volunteer force during the summer going on checking these um nests i would highly recommend it it is fun and we do a little training and put you on the permit to do so so it's uh, a lot of fun so keep an eye out um in our 
correspondence. But I'm going to get uh, move on to our next topic, which is our threats to Purple Martins. So as you can imagine, Desert Purple Martins, like many other birds, are affected by habitat destruction through urbanization and climate change. Saguaros take 100 to 150 years to reach the size necessary to host purple martins. I'll say that again, it's 100 to 150 years. That is a long time. The uh, saguaros are protected species, which means destroying them is illegal. And you even have to get a special permit from Arizona Department of Agriculture, even if you just want to move it on your own property. But even so, uh, transplanted saguaros require a lot of care, and those below four feet tall are the, uh, the ones with the highest chance of actually surviving that transplant. So it's not always um, successful after you, know, you move a saguaro to make room for a new neighborhood. So that, in addition to drought and invasive buffalo grass, um, is putting these saguaros in peril. The wildfires uh, destroy saguaros because they're not adapted to a fire regime. Native desert grasses are usually sparse and they don't carry a fire far. So uh, a lightning strike would naturally cause a small burn uh, before running out of fuel. Meanwhile, buffalo grass is so widespread and burns hot and fast. So that causes uh, major uh, deaths in saguaro colonies. Saguaros are one of the primary providers of cavities here, and only our Gila woodpeckers and gilded flickers are capable of excavating them. All um, other cavity nesting species rely on abandoned holes to take, to take them over for their own nesting spots. And as you can imagine, this creates a lot of competition for suitable nesting spots. And on top of that, there is some vandalism and theft of saguaros in the wild as well. We are undertaking a massive effort to plant 14,000 saguaros in the next three years and working with partners to reestablish uh, colonies of saguaros past um, post burn and help them colonize areas projected to be viable so our habitat in the future. So we are preparing for those changes in the climate um, that are soon to be here. We are also hosting a nest box design challenge. And unlike the Eastern does or the Eastern Purple Martins, our desert purple martins are not known to use nest boxes currently. And if you have followed our journey with Lucy's warbler nest boxes, you know that this may just be a matter of the right design and conditions. We were able to test and design the nest box for Lucy's warblers that they're now readily using. So what we're trying to do is do a similar thing with the purple martins. With the help of grants and donor support, we're able to host uh, this design challenge, which features cash prizes, which is a, always a good incentive. We plan to implement everything that we've learned so far about their preferences and involve the creativity of the larger public to design the nest box that mimics the characteristics of saguaros in their temperature buffering capabilities. And this will be our effort to increase the suitable nesting opportunities for desert purple martins. And potentially other species will benefit um, indirectly because this, the whole size that we're looking for is can be used by other species as well. <clears throat> so some guidelines that we provide on our website, which will also be sent out to everybody who registered for this presentation. We will send out the link to our details. 
you also have our contact information for any additional questions. But what you see here on the right is what a saguaro cavity looks like on the inside. Well, this is what we call a saguaro boot. When the saguaro dies and it desiccates in the desert, this is what is left over afterwards. It's the scar tissue of an excavated hole that woodpeckers created. And this is what we are trying to mimic internally in our nest box design. So from 120 cavities that we've analyzed so far, we have gathered, as well as some literature um, that we studied, we gathered the following guidelines to share with you all. The opening must be between two and three and a half inches in range. And we don't give you like an exact number because it certainly is still a range. They're not only going for one specific uh, number, but there is a range. And depending on whether they're using a Gila woodpecker cavity or a gilded flicker cavity, it can be uh, anywhere in between those two numbers. The drop is the space between the bottom of the hole to the very bottom of the cavity. So the bottom here, then drop, if you were to uh, drop a little weight down to the the bottom, it would be between seven and a quarter to 11 inches deep. And internally, if you are creating a square box, they must be five and a half to 6.2 uh, inches by the same number. Or for cylindrical cavities, that would be your diameter as well. Other things to consider include a safe cavity access for the birds to fly in and out. So that means that the inside of a nest box can be completely smooth. That may mean that the young have a hard time to climb up to the opening once they're ready. Um, also, they must be able to fly directly into the nest box or to land onto the opening. Average outside temperature during nest season range from 95 to 110 degrees. So it's very hot. We're in the middle of our summer season and our overnights are between 70 and 90 degrees. And on average, the saguaro cavity, what we found is that it buffers daily minimum and maximum ambient temperatures by six to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. We actually went out and collected this information by, <clears throat> excuse me, putting little temperature gauges inside the cavities. And what we saw is that there were smaller, there's definitely a, a buffer and there's also a bit of a delay, as you can see, so that the, those, the minimums and the maximums are not huge so that it doesn't affect the nestlings inside. Of course, in our harsh summer conditions, you must consider durability of materials when you're creating your design. They must uh, be able to withstand our summer conditions and our monsoon season, which is a, our wettest season and they must be able to not disintegrate in the sun or the rain as well as not collect any water inside so that usually means drainage holes entrance overhang things like that it is some a typical birdhouse we will also need to be able to open the nest box to do maintenance uh, or to band the chicks in the future. So the design must include a way to open it like a little door or sometimes um, the top uh, is lifted to reveal the inside. We are not requiring to include mounting hardware with the design, but a short explanation of how the nest box is meant to be mounted is uh, all that we expect. And what you should know is that it is it will be expected to be between 15 and 25 feet high up in the air uh, and not necessarily on a saguaro, actually not on a saguaro because what we're trying to do is go to places where 
the desert is otherwise really good, but it, the sawaras are lacking or cavities are lacking in the sawaras that are there. So they must be uh, freestanding. Everything else is really up to your imagination. We didn't want to um, stifle your creativity, but we just gave general directions on what we know the Purple Martins love and prefer. Everything else like materials and dimensions on the outside will be up to you. The design it, challenge itself is open to all ages. You can submit as an individual or a group and you can submit an unlimited number of designs. So if you have multiple good ideas, feel free to submit all of them. When you click on our website on the submit button, you will be asked to answer a couple questions in the short form. You can also preview that uh, beforehand. Then you will be asked to upload a document, a single document, which includes a list of materials. So we need to know how to recreate your design. Uh, of course, we'll need a sketch that indicates dimensions and how it's all put together. And of course, an installation method description. Finally, attach a short paragraph describing the reasoning behind the design. Uh, this can be why you think this material buffers temperature well, or that you have had experience with doing this in other parts of the United States, and you've had success with this, something um, to just give more depth to your design. Make sure that all file names include the name on the submission form so that once we download those files, we are able to say this one was submitted by Joe Smith. If it only says Purple Martin Nest Box Design, it'll be hard to track down who actually submitted it. Um, you also have the option to submit a physical prototype of your design. It is not required. We wanted it to be open to all, um, all levels of ability, uh, financial uh, ability, because um, not everyone can actually build one and send it across the United States to us, that is totally okay. But if you are able to do so, we would really be very grateful for that because otherwise we will have to be recreating a lot of them, which will take a lot of our time. And of course, we wanna do well by your design and make sure that it's created to your standards. Also, if you are using non-standard materials, such as um, a 3D printed, Nest box. Uh, we don't have a 3D printer, so um, please send it in and we'll test it for you. Um, all that we ask is that your prototype includes your name and it's sent to us uh, by uh, February 15th. If that's not, if you're having trouble having it delivered to us by that date, which is a submission date, please email me and we can certainly uh, make accommodations because we won't be testing them until a little bit later. You can, if you are local to Tucson or Arizona, you can drop them off in person at our nature shop and our nature shop hours change seasonally. So you can um, look at our website for the most up-to-date information on that. We are located on University Avenue and Fifth Avenue, or University Boulevard and Fifth Avenue. Of course, as I said, make sure your prototype is labeled with the same name as your submission. Um, each design will be evaluated by a panel of staff and we'll be looking at the following criteria. Dimensions, of course, everything that we have provided you and make sure that it's in the same range. Cost effectiveness, how easy will it be for us to recreate and make many, many of them to put out on the landscape. Ease of installation, um, it has to be able to go up fairly easily, come down fairly easily. And of course, durability, as I was saying, be able to withstand our harsh 
temperatures as well as our monsoon season. The designs that fit those criteria will be created. So if you sent in a prototype, we will take that prototype. Otherwise, we will create one based on your design. And we will then test them for temperature buffer capabilities. Um, they must be within 6 to 10 degrees in outdoor conditions for we'll be testing for two weeks. Based on those results, we will select 12 winners. That is a lot of winners. We were tr truly trying to incentivize participation because there's a lot of awesome um, prizes. The first place, there's going to be first place for each category. We have youth category and adult. First place for each is going to be $500. And then five runners up for each category is $100 each. So altogether, you have 12 winners and they will be notified via email to arrange award receipt. So getting your um, address, making sure that you accept the prize. And um, the best two or three designs after that, after we've established um, the winners, those will then be created in multiples and put out on the landscape to see which the Purple Martins are actually selecting. So we may think that we know what they prefer and we know a lot about what they prefer, but they will be our final judge for the best design that they will go for. So 2023 is going to be a very exciting year for us. And I am so excited to see what we find and also all the interesting designs that people are going to submit. So if designing a nest box is not your thing, that is totally okay. You can get, you can do other ways to get involved. You can sponsor a saguaro planting, or you can create a fundraiser to raise um, money uh, for uh, a sponsorship of a saguaro. You could also get involved directly with planting saguaros. We're going to be starting in March, so keep an eye out for volunteer opportunities to plant tiny baby saguaros. It is really exciting because you can visit your little baby saguaro in the years to come and even maybe your grandkids too to see how big they've grown and uh, follow along their journey. We'll also need more nest monitors so as we head into another breeding season towards uh, June and July, we'll be sending out an email asking for more help, looking for more nests, for new nests to report to us. If you'd like to use an endoscope, you can. It's not necessary. There's different levels of getting involved. So you can just report a nest or you can actually visit a nest weekly and monitor it. And of course, spread the word. You can share our work and encourage those you might think would be interested to submit a nest box design for consideration. We especially want more involvement from kids. I know it's so exciting to get young, bright brains on the um, challenge like this. So if you know of a class or a scout troop that would be interested, please do share this information and our website, which will be sent out to you as well. And the deadline again is February 15th of this year. So we have about a month still. And if it is only a design, it's a little bit easier to submit that within the deadline. Of course, we thank our partners and volunteers that make this work possible. And I wanted to make sure to leave uh, a bit of a time at the end to answer questions. And um, Jenny, potentially, if you see any in the chat, let me know. I yeah, we had two questions, questions in the chat. One um, is from Greg Corman asking, what kind of poles do you anticipate using to mount the nest boxes, like metal or wood? We, um, I was thinking, we're not really, you know, we haven't landed specifically on that, but what we've had experience with is using uh, galvanized steel pipe and then 
threading it into the bottom of the nest box and then using guiding wires to keep it still. Yeah. So that's been really um, successful. For things like kestrels and fly catcher boxes, those sorts of like exactly. other species. Yeah. yeah, if possible to use a different uh, medium like a wood, uh, we would just have to make sure that it goes you know, deeper into the ground uh, to be able to stand on its own without the wires. The other question in the chat is, have any boxes been tried before? Any interest in them by Martins? Um, I don't think that any have been tried. I know that some people have put up the Eastern designs down here and they have not had any takers. But again, it may be the case of um, wrong conditions. So uh, as we found out, they want to be pretty high up between 15 and 25 feet up high. Um, uh, a lot of the Eastern nest box designs are met, made out of metal. So that might be a little bit too hot in this condition. So uh, as far as I know, there haven't been any success so far. Yeah, I've never, there's no documented case of Desert Purple Martins using a man-made cavity. It's Desert Purple Martins. Mm -hmm. And then the see, there's another one, a question just came in. Does the Conservation Society from East Coast support this effort at all? Oh, the Purple Martin Conservation Association? Oh yeah, they're huge partners in this. They've been promoting the contest for us. Yeah, there there have been really great partners. Yeah, exactly. And then, um in partnership with them, we're able to put trackers on them. And yeah. um, it is something that they're very interested in. And so it's been, they've learned so much already that we're learning from them. And then they're also involved in our work here. So it's been a great partnership. All right. If anyone wants to unmute to ask a question, that's totally fine. Or if you want to put it in the chat, either way. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing so I can see everybody again. <laughs> Thank you all for dedicating your evening uh, to join us tonight. It certainly is fun to share. Uh, hello. Yeah, hi, Carol. Hi, I'm sorry. I lived in New York and uh, the Sawmill River Audubon um, has gourds that they're using for nesting for the Purple Martins. Are you f familiar with that? They're African gourds uh, that they use and cut them out and form them, put them up on poles. And they've had nestings in, in the park where I used to go in Croton that they would come to them. It, it's not, it's individual gourds. It's not um, the little apartment buildings like they had. Yeah, so that's another thing that we'll have to test out is how close they want to nest here because as Jenny mentioned earlier, we're just finding out that they'll nest in the same saguaro. That's not, um, not, not the most common thing that we've seen. And it may be that, you know, territoriality is different with this subspecies or um, that there's just, you know, the saguaro compared to a, a Purple Martin Hotel is totally a different yeah well no this isn't a hotel I mean they are near one another but okay. they individually use the gourds and yeah, I don't it's... know if the material I'm not you know scientific at all if there's any kind of an insulating material that could be put around the gourd that would permit for the heat but if if you contact the sawmill Audubon it's in Westchester County they might be able to discuss or head brainstorm with you about it yeah, because we use gourds out here uh, for Lucy's warblers. We tried, we did some gourd nests, oh, okay. which know. were I'm... successful. It's weird because I, I don't know if the gourds just aren't insulated enough. Or like you say, maybe if you added insulation to a gourd, that might be a good um, a good way to to try that. Mm -hmm. But it's such an interesting question because the, the Arboricola, the other Western subspecies of Martins, does use nest boxes as well and have even been documented nesting in freeway in Sacramento, California, nesting in sort of drainage holes in overpasses and bridges. So the other two subspecies in North America will use artificial cavities, the Eastern ones especially. It's just these desert ones have never been documented doing it. So and they must need a very specialized box is what we're, we're hoping is the case that they will use a box if it's sufficiently 
similar to a saguaro with the conditions inside a saguaro cavity. But yeah, it's such a fascinating question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I just throw it at you. I, I don't know too much, but you could always ask them if, if it yeah. suits you. And that's you know. a good point. Okay. But we shared it with other Audubon chapters across the uh, United States to make sure that we get, you know, as much input because other um, people have encountered similar, you know, issues. Uh, they, I know some people are doing nest boxes that are insulated for roosting cavities for woodpeckers to spend their winters in and things like that. So um, they, you know, they all can use their expertise to submit a design for this challenge. Because they put out some decoys to kind of attract them. Right, yeah. To where and, they had the poles up and stuff. So anyhow. And I think we're going to do the same thing once we're going to be testing them out. Yeah, people also well, play sounds sometimes too. They'll play sounds of a colony to a, in the eastern United States. Yeah. Um, so we have two new questions as well. Go ahead, Olia. Uh, yeah, so, okay, how might you raise the boxes up and down the poles? Um, there are some designs that I know of in the east that have a mechanism that makes it easy to bring them up and down. Um, I am just not familiar enough to know the mechanism itself, but um, I think they're easily available on the website. And I think we might be replicating that mechanism as well. This is where those Eastern partners come in real handy. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know they do sometimes do a flagpole setup with the, the winching sort of rope, those big condo like nests that they use out East or like those round circles with the gourds hanging on them. They will sometimes use a flagpole setup, mm -hmm. but there's gotta be other ways to do it too, that many brilliant people in the East have come up with. Yeah, and I yeah, as I imagine, it would be like a pulley system going up and down. <clears throat> Are there any desert martins in the area you are planning to mount your designs? So we'll probably be uh, testing our designs in an area um, of our Mason Center, which is an area that the purple martins are known to frequent. Yeah, and they yeah. They're definitely nesting nearby and in the area. So that's how we'll know that the purple martins are there and they're having, they have the option to use this nest box. But in the future, once we identify a nest design that they love, we'll be installing them in locations that lack um, good cavities in the hopes that the passing purple martins will see it during migration and take it up as um, a suitable cavity for them. Um, Jenny, um, have you investigated desert martins in saguaros in urban areas? My son lives in the suburban 1960s style neighborhood in Scottsdale and has multiple holes in use by what I believe purple martins. So that's a really good question from two angles. Uh, one, they don't really nest up in the Phoenix area. As strange as that sounds, even though there are saguaros up in Phoenix, that is a different type of Sonoran Desert. That's the lowland Sonoran Desert. So you can kind of visually see the difference when you visit you know, Phoenix versus Tucson, that the Sonoran Desert in Tucson is a little more lush looking, has more trees, has more vegetation in general. Although even though you find saguaros in both, purple martins don't go into the Phoenix Basin really so much to nest. We do get them up in Tonto, but not so much in Phoenix. So even in you know, nice looking saguaros near urban Phoenix or even in wild, you know, non-urban, wild Sonoran Desert habitat near Phoenix, they don't really nest. And we think this has to do with just the amount of rainfall. These are primarily insect eating birds. So they don't really have enough resources to nest up in those Phoenix area saguaros, but they're very abundant in the habitat around Tucson. So the urban question is one I was very curious about, especially in 2020, where I was trying to find the most urban nest I could find. <laughs> that was my goal. That was one of my goals that first summer. What's the most urban pair of nesting uh, martins I could find? And you see some really lovely saguaros in urban Tucson that have a lot of big saguaros, with lots of cavities. We have never found nesting martins in a densely urban area. 
or even really sort of a densely suburban area. We have found them in areas like Greasewood Park nesting. And so that's a big patch of Sonoran Desert, really pretty close to West Tucson. You know, you don't have to travel very far. It's just a few miles to densely urban area, but it's surrounded by pretty, you know, intact Sonoran Desert. We have found them in really loosely suburban areas, kind of almost like ranch housing kind of conditions in Salrita. So I think what, what is going on is they'll do okay in pretty loosely suburban areas. We've People do sometimes have them nesting in their yards in places like at the base of the Catalinas, Sabino Canyon area, Soldier Trail Road, areas like that. People do get Martins nesting and swarrows in their yard, but they have to have pretty much right adjacent large patches of intact Sonoran Desert and high quality Sonoran Desert. And so if you live yeah. in densely urban Tucson, they're not going to nest in your yard. Yeah. Even if you have a big swarrow. But if you do have a nesting purple martin somewhere near your house, let us know because we're yeah. hoping to put up a camera on one of the nests outside of one of the nests so we can have a 24-7 view of them via live security camera. So that usually requires power and Wi-Fi. So we have to be kind of close to an urban spot there. So let us know. Um, can you post the chart that lists where they are nesting? Yes, let me get that. I do have a really nice map we've put together of every nesting swirl we have found. Uh, let me get that. I will also make sure to share that in the follow-up email with the recording link. Okay. And this map also gives a nice um, sort of clue showing the fact that they're really not near Phoenix at all. And it's weird. If you look at Ebert, that Ebert map I showed right at the beginning of the talk uh, with the little purple square showing where they were in July and August, that map very uh, sort of obviously excludes Phoenix. They just, they pass through on migration, like the Arboricola subspecies, but they just don't nest up in the Phoenix area. And I think it's really just tied to the fact that there's just not enough rain up there to produce the amount of insects in the monsoon that these birds really need. They also seem to have a really interesting relationship with water that we've been investigating in the past several years, and we're going to continue to try to get a handle on this, where they need water that, like water bodies that they can zoom over and get a drink from. And they'll use all sorts of stuff, ponds, golf hazards, all sorts of things, you know, water hazards in a golf course. We've had lots of reports of that, but they seem willing to fly pretty far to get it. So, people, you know, the Martins nesting way on the west side are probably utilizing, you know, west of Tucson are probably utilizing ponds and golf courses or who knows, but there does seem to be an interesting relationship with that as well. Lots to learn still. So <laughs> lots of work ahead of us. Yeah. I'm really excited. <laughs> All right. Are there any other questions? Again, we're available by email, of course, if anything does come up. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate um, to have your time to share our uh, work. So we hope that to see some design submissions for the contest from you all. So thank you all and have a good evening. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Yes, swimming.